As politicians and military in Western Europe realise that it looks like war is going to come, a British delegation was in Poland. There was an arrangement, an agreement made that if the Polish Navy needed to get out of the Baltic, if Germany invaded, that they would be welcome to sail out of the Baltic, which is too small to, to survive. The arrangement was the Polish Navy could sail out of the Baltic, come across the North Sea to a little island off Fife called the Isle of May and radio in to, to here, to Recife, and, and then they would be escorted into the Forth to receive safe haven here in Scotland. When Germany invaded and, and attacked Poland at the very start of World War II, the Orsha was based in Gdynia and was active in trying to combat the, the German ships that were also attacking the ports. But that was very difficult. Such a large submarine in such a small body of water, quite shallow, they decided to sail into neutral Estonia, to Tallinn, to put the, the captain off the sub for medical attention and I guess to try and figure out what they're going to do next. And Estonia was under a lot of pressure from both the Germans and the Soviets. They were under pressure to intern the submarine and to take it out of the battle. They're being disarmed, torpedoes are going to be taken off. One of the interesting points is they had a visit from the, the British naval attaché. He gives over two business cards with his name on. And after he's gone, they look at the cards and on the back, he's written a couple of little messages. One says, good luck. And the other says, God bless you. And and it's told in the, the, the Admiralty archives when the Royal Navy interviewed the submariners later, they said that when they read that, it helped them to decide, we're going to escape, we're going to Britain. They decided that they would try and get out at night under cover of darkness and that they created a a battle plan to overpower the guards who were on the submarine, cut through the ropes and also disable the crane that was taking off the torpedoes because they wanted to keep the torpedoes for any German ships that they could see back in the Baltic. The Orschel came to Recife because Recife is the closest secure and safe naval dockyard to the Baltic. And when you come out of the Baltic, coming across the North Sea, really the first place you can get to is it uh, provides a very safe haven because it's a deep estuary, so 20 miles inland almost. You bring in the ships or the submarines uh, and it's very well protected by the defensive uh, forces around it at that time. No charts for, for anywhere, really. So they have no maps, no charts. One of the officers had, had drawn from memory what, what he could think of as far as you know, lighthouses and, and different navigation points. Difficult, I would imagine, even with maps and charts, without proper maps and charts, extremely challenging. I'm formerly a sailor myself, and understanding the difficulty of trying to navigate a submarine in enemy waters without proper tools, navigation tools and so on, is an absolutely extraordinary story. Gdy wreszcie dotarliśmy do Anglii, nie mieliśmy na pokładzie zupełnie słodkiej wody. Mało brakowało, a zginęlibyśmy pod wodą z pragnienia. The radio had also been damaged, so they were trying to fix the radio because the plan with the British was that they would radio ahead for help. And also, uh, if you don't radio and tell them where you are, they're going to think you're an enemy submarine and try and sink you. The Orzhul finally arrived at Recife in October 1939. 
Winston Churchill said it was, it was one of the most poignant, most epic stories of World War II. The Orshaw was docked here at Versailles three times, in fact, whilst it was operating with the British Royal Navy. We keep a record of every time that we bring a ship into a dry dock. We have three dry docks here, um, plus an emergency dry dock. And at the time of the Second World War, we actually had a floating dock as well. And so the, we have a record here of the dates that the Orgel was in dry dock. We have a record of the drafts, which is the, the, the amount of depth underwater at the, at the forward end and the aft end of the submarine. So after the Orgel reaches Recife, they're very keen to, to get back into the fight, but the submarine needs some work done on it. During the Second World War, Poland provided a number of troops who worked here in Scotland. And in fact, it was the Polish Defence Force that was responsible for mounting the defence of the whole of the Rosyth Royal Dockyard. There was both a naval defence force in the fourth and a land-based defence force all around the Rosyth Royal Dockyard. At this point in the war, there was a big focus on Norway when Germany secretly launched the invasion of Norway. The Orzel happened to be on patrol and, and was in the right place at the right time to see a large cargo ship, which they managed to identify as German from Hamburg, the Rio de Janeiro, and they attacked and, and managed to sink her with, with uh, torpedoes, not actually realizing that it was full of German troops being sent to invade Norway. So that was a, a significant success. As I start to learn something about this epic story, I then also noticed on my internet search that were, there were memorials to the Orzel at different locations in Europe where she was you know, built and interned, you know, stationed. And yet here in Recife, which was a, a big part of her story, there was nothing to remind people. With my friend Colin Maxwell, we started a little plan, a little notion to try and do something, and maybe just a small plaque somewhere in Recife. Idea i pomysł upamiętnienia związków najsławniejszej polskiej łodzi podwodnej ORP Orzu ze Szkocją ma pełne nasze wsparcie. Ta historia jest wciąż za mało znana. Chcemy ją opowiedzieć, dlatego że jesteśmy to winni pokoleniom polskich bohaterów, polskich marynarzy i ich oficerów, którzy od pierwszego do ostatniego dnia wojny służyli na okrętach marynarki wojennej II Rzeczpospolitej i walczyli u boku Royal Navy przez okres całej wojny. Samo przybycie Orła do Szkocji jest bardzo symboliczne. Wyobrażamy sobie taką scenę, w której orzeł po wielu dniach samotnej bohaterskiej wędrówki, uciekając z Stalina z internowania, szczęśliwie przybliża się, przypływa do wybrzeży Szkocji. I na jego spotkanie wychodzi niszczyciel HMS Vadarus Royal Navy, który ma go bezpiecznie doprowadzić do szkockiego portu Rosside. To jest bardzo znaczące, bo to pokazuje sojusz naszych krajów i współpracę podczas II wojny światowej, a także dzisiaj, kiedy nasze siły zbrojne współpracują, budując potencjał morski floty Marynarki Wojennej Rzeczypospolitej Polskiej w ramach programu Miecznik, a także w ramach programu obrony przeciwrakietowej NAREW. Szczególnie cieszy nas udział w tym projekcie lokalnych szkockich i angielskich historyków, lokalnych władz, które nas wspierają, a także dwóch stoczni, brytyjskiej stoczni działającej w Rosside Babcock oraz stoczni Damen Naval Królestwa Niderlandów, która oryginalnie niesie tradycję i zbudowała orła przed wojną dla marynarki wojennej II Rzeczypospolitej. Naszą ideą jest budowanie wyjątkowego miejsca pamięci, które będzie pokazywało współpracę i więzy łączące marynarkę wojenną II Rzeczypospolitej z marynarką wojenną Zjednoczonego Królestwa, Royal Navy, zlokalizowane w szczególnym miejscu dla historii w Rosside, gdzie nie tylko orzeł, ale wiele innych okrętów barnarki wojennej RP podczas wojny dokowało, przechodziło remonty i wychodziło w bój. We decided to support the Orzeł Memorial because of two reasons. First of all, it's a key part of our history. So when somebody wants to come along and help us to tell part of the story, of Recife Royal Dockyard. We're very happy to help with that. But also, of course, it's a great link between our two countries. We're now in a partnership. Babcock is in a partnership 
with the Polish government, with uh, PGZ specifically, um, to help to build the Mieszczyk program frigates. So it felt like the Orschel story was a great way to help to seal and cement that, um, that bond between the two organisations. The Orschel's final patrol was standard in that they were given a, a box to go and, and patrol in an area that was just for them. And after, I think, a week, they were to signal and to be designated a different patrol area, but no contact was made, which could be, you know, if you can't surface because you're being hunted, uh, could be your radio's not working properly, atmospheric conditions. So it doesn't always mean it's a disaster, but there was no contact. And eventually, with continuing, no messaging, no sight, no sound from the, the submarine, eventually the Admiralty decide she must be sunk. And even to this day, people are trying to find out where is she, what happened. The North Sea is relatively undeep and there is a lot of current. So objects, even submarines or even bigger ships, they move. So all the objects on, on the bottom of the sea, they move around. So it is very, very difficult to map the North Sea. Another very interesting uh, parallel, there is also still one Dutch submarine. And this submarine was the O-13, also built by Diamond Naval in the same period, they were both operating, both the Orzel and the O13, were operating from here, from Rosside. And they had a very similar tasking and mission in the North Sea, and both submarines did not return from that mission, still on patrol. The Polish Navy and the Dutch Navy, they have special committees to locate all missing submarines, and they already have some expeditions to, to look for the submarine. I'm very confident though that it will be found eventually. The technology for finding assets on the seabed is improving all of the time, so I'm really confident we will find it eventually. I think one day she will be found.